none of us came from crypto. Nobody comes from crypto. So because of that, you know, we wanted to kind of have a platform to educate the masses um, and hopefully us being in the space for as long as we have provides some level of value to our listeners. Welcome to the first episode of Inner Sphere, hosted by myself, Graham, and my amazing colleague, Brian Mint. Woo! Yes, super <laughs> glad to be here. And uh, we're finally doing this. We're finally doing this. Yes, we are very thrilled. Um, so with this being our first episode, we wanted to take some time to sort of lay the groundwork of what we expect to cover, uh, to really get into the cadence of how we're delivering information. Um, our goals with this new podcast that we're kicking off, uh, many of you have potentially seen some of our content in the past. Brian and I uh, really love to show up at Republic and provide a lot of knowledge and insight. Obviously, the title Inner Sphere uh, really refers to what we're seeing inside the industry, um, what's going on from capital investments on the private side to what is being built and developed to everything that we're seeing going on on the macro as well. We're really going to strive to cover as much information as possible, reduce it uh, to a, a middle ground. We don't want to be 101, right? Uh, but we aren't going to be too advanced uh, without taking you along with us. So hopefully throughout this process, we can introduce a lot of topics um, and present them in ways that are very easily digestible. Does that make sense, Brian? Totally, man. 100% agree. I mean, you know, as as you mentioned, like, I think that we love the kind of organic way this thing started. You know, we've just been kind of sharing our knowledge. I think we both kind of share this um, love or passion to educate people in this space, because that's how we got started ourselves. None of us came from crypto. Nobody comes from crypto. So because of that, you know, we wanted to kind of have a platform to educate the masses um, and hopefully us being in the space for as long as we have provides some level of value to our listeners. Absolutely. Um, you know, that kind of leads me into my, my, my first goal, um, which is that we at Republic do a lot of things, right? Uh, the retail side, the Reg CF platform is probably the most notable and, or I should say visible uh, would be the correct way. But in doing so, I wanted to bring people up to speed a little bit with everything that we're doing on the crypto department because we've, we've grown tremendously. Um, we're really excited with all of the offerings we have. But turns out that Brian here uh, is actually a co-founder and has been with the team earlier than anyone else uh, aside from Ken, our, our fearless leader. Uh, so with that being said, Brian, I mean, could you just take us on a little introductory story of what, what this all started out as? And then we can kind of bring it up to what it's morphed into. Yes, of course. Um, thank you for that. And um, that that's a that's a great topic. I mean, I love talking about this because people look at Republic Crypto and Republic and they're like, what do you guys even do and how did you come to be, right? I mean, it all kind of started with the mission and Republic is a very mission-driven company. And our main goal is to really democratize access to private investing, kind of simple as that. But more deeply, you know, when I met Ken back in 2017, you know, he was building Republic, this place to democratize access to investing. And this was also the same time, as you know, Graham, that ICOs were super popping, right? Oh, so this, this was like literal Wild West. It was a boom. A lot of like potentially unregulated securities were being sold. A lot of just really like crazy stuff was happening. It was like so exciting. That's what that's what um, drew us, right? Like we were we loved that. However, my perspective from being in the space and being at a hedge fund right before Republic, and for those that don't know, you know, Graham and I met before Republic at our respective funds, uh, which we'll probably get into another episode on the pod, but I came from Torion Capital, Graham, TLDR Capital, of course. Uh, we, you know, we saw that there were a ton of unregulated sales and potentially shady things happening, right? So when I heard about the mission that Ken was trying to achieve, I immediately thought that this can be applied to cryptocurrency investing. And I immediately thought that, you know, retail adoption the right way would be great for blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. So, you know, I basically worked with Ken to come up and start Republic Crypto. And our initial goal of Republic Crypto was to provide a compliant platform for anybody around the world, regardless of their net wealth, to invest in cryptocurrency. 
what did we discover? We discovered that there actually wasn't a lot of interest in uh, retail to invest in cryptocurrency. And it was also very, very hard to get companies to sell to US retail. So because of that, we actually, you know, made a little bit of a change. We decided that instead of making a compliant, like kind of forcing a compliant way for people to invest, we're like, well, let's legitimize blockchain technology first so that it'll still further our goal of allowing everybody to invest in crypto. So that's where Republic Advisory Services was born. And that was the first major business line of Republic Crypto. And uh, through that, you know, we started working with founders. We started working with different projects. We made relationships with funds, uh, other layer one projects, et cetera, to really kind of create this community of trustworthy founders that were educated, that knew how to navigate the regulatory space, that knew how to build and were connected to other founders. And that was the birth of Republic Advisory Services. And now we have many other verticals. And uh, Graham, you know, you, you're familiar with some of these. Um, you want to kind of like start talking about some of the other verticals aside from advisory that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it's just a funny origin story because you're talking about 2017 trying to sort of walk the line on on how do we regulate this thing in the U.S.? How do we get it into the hands of U.S. investors? Um, and it's kind of mind blowing to see that this many years later, we haven't really moved very far on that. <laughs> it's so, hard, man. Yeah, I mean, that's just like something to keep in note as to, I mean, how early this industry still is. Um, but, you know, back to everything that we've been building, Brian really covered advisory. I would say, you know, to this day, it's one of our, our core elements, um, moving people from seed to liquidity and really navigating everything that it takes to launch a tokenized product in this ecosystem um, and in this, this, this world, this crypto Web3 world. Um, but that led us into a variety of other things too, right? Um, as we were working with people, we discovered that they needed assistance building these smart contracts, actually building the tokens, the things that the tokens interact with, right? You've released a token, but... How do you make it work, right? Uh, and that led to a tokenization vertical. We started with our very own Republic Note, um, which is still and remains to this day a cutting edge piece of tech in the securities token space. We're still not seeing that many securities coming out. Um, and we founded it on Algorand, a new L1 that was just uh, much more friendly, again, towards whitelisted accounts, uh, basically everything you need to do a compliant securities issuance. Um, but that led us to build a whole tokenization vertical where to this day, we are still building technical assets for people. Very practical. <laughs> Blockchains are open sourced public ledgers that utilize decentralized consensus to validate truth. These ledgers record a history of transactions or actions that have occurred within a specific period of time known as a block. As transactions occur, they compete for space inside a block. Once inside the block, the transaction is confirmed, that block will be closed and a new one opened, forming a chain. In the case of consensus not being reached, the blockchain will utilize the longest available chain in a fork or the greatest example of historical truth. In Bitcoin, these transactions represent an exchange of a financial asset known as Bitcoin. On Ethereum, the transactions represent rented compute time from the global computer that is the Ethereum network. Any user can increase the speed of their confirmation by increasing the gas price paid to miners who confirm the transaction to mine a block. Miners and or validators, as they might be known, provide security to the network and earn rewards in the form of the blockchain's native assets in return. We've been discussing different cycles going on. Uh, obviously, there's the macro, right? Um, we've got Bitcoin, we've got ETH, we've got all the competitors yep. ETH out there, right? The ETH killers. Um, then we saw DeFi. DeFi really had this strong bubble in twenty summer of 2020, right? Uh, I think we saw a lot of wealth get created um, and some really interesting DeFi projects just to look at. I think the earlier ones are in a more mature space is Curve. Uh, Aave, a money market, um, all very active, all very decentralized at this point. If you want to learn more, you can go to their website, hop in their Discord, and literally see governance votes. Uh, essentially, it's like their board of directors is this open, high biz uh, group of token holders, right? So the the knowledge is there. All you got to do is kind of engage. 
Um, and one of the cool things about protocols is by engaging and learning, you can often get airdrops, right? That's pretty rad. 100%. I mean, speaking of airdrops, I think like the thing that kind of kicked off to me, the thing that kicked off DeFi summer that got my radar on it was the Uniswap um, yeah. kind of rumblings of an airdrop. And then, but before that, it was sushi swaps kind of vampire attack on uniswap that led to uh sushi tokens being kind of created and all of that stuff right so you know without really i'm cool sure story. that whole drama can be a podcast episode on its own so i'm not going to dive super deep into it but once i saw that happen and the uniswap countered back with their airdrop of tokens and other applications just kind of like legitimizing DeFi by building around these ecosystems that was really exciting for me. And like all of these things were happening kind of internationally, you know, through community members, just through organic engagement, through Discord and Telegram and all these places. And that was super fascinating to me. And on top of that, like, you know, you, you start to wonder like, wow, this can actually serve as an alternative financial system for people that are priced out or don't have access to traditional finance means, right? So. I think that realization happened in summer of 2020, DeFi summer, and the level of innovation just kind of skyrocketed from there. Um, and of course, you know, we can't talk about DeFi summer without talking about yield farming. Yield farming was probably the main thing that attracted everybody into crypto, you know, good or bad. You know, you saw a lot of really crazy yields, right? You know, today, you know, before crypto, I would get like 3%, I would see a 3% on like a CD and I'd be like, oh, dude. That's dope. And then like today, you know, in, in DeFi, DeFi summer, you saw like, you know, thousand percent API, APY, 100% APY, 50% APYs. And obviously those are all with do your own due diligence and figure out what's actually happening. Um, but those are all extremely attractive. And Graham, as you mentioned kind of earlier in the episode, what you're seeing is that the community is now making the revenue of the platform in the same way that in traditional uh, finance, like the bank is capturing all that upside. So instead of a, when the banks, like people are getting replaced by code, a lot of that upside is now being sent straight to the community. And that's the beauty of blockchain and DeFi, right? So those are the things that kind of excite me. Those are the things that made DeFi summer such a huge realization for people into crypto. And uh, I think that like that kind of kicked off a lot of this mass adoption thing that now is leading to NFTs and all that. Would you yeah, would you say that that's how you saw it? I, I completely agree. You know, um, again, this is digital money. Like I say, it's, it's smart money. It's meant to be active. Um, and a lot of these protocols are actually like traditional financial products, right? Take your capital, put it here. We'll do something with it. A variety of things that can be done. That's your utility. Um, but some of them, of the many that were launched, are actually showing real utility. So it is very interesting that rather than just buying and holding or being a pure speculator, you can actually put your, your value to work, I would say, rather than money, um, if you value the financial ecosystem and the capacity to trade these things, then you could place your tokens in that world and maybe be rewarded for it. Now, as you mentioned, that's the DeFi bubble. Then we got into this next bubble, uh, of NFTs, which is again, very, very separate from what Bitcoin is. I would say they almost don't even have any overlap to be completely honest. Um, and NFTs this year, right, yeah. Brian? I mean, how much NFT activity have we seen? Insane. This year specifically, 2022, we're only in February, 2022. And for those that have been tracking the market, the beginning of this year actually started with a crash, but NFTs were literally unaffected by this crash which is super, super fascinating because, you know, in a market that historically kind of trends with every, the movement of major cryptocurrencies, you kind of, we kind of expected the NFT market to cool off. But in fact, OpenSea did record numbers of sales, Ford Ape Yacht Club prices are through the roof. It's just wild. And I think the kind of the super, super interesting part about this is now NFTs are part of culture, right? Culture yes. is like a huge thing that will basically launch crypto and blockchain technology to the mainstream. Uh, and that's very exciting for people like us, you know, back in 2017, 2018, we we're like, oh, yeah, institutions, when are people going to get in? And like, we talked about DeFi summer, that was very exciting for nerds like us, but it's not exciting for like our friends. But seeing like Snoop Dogg by a CryptoPunk, 
or Justin Bieber buying a Bored Ape Yacht Club uh, avatar is very, very interesting for everybody else. So Graham, I know you have a background in entertainment and culture. Um, I'm sure you have very interesting perspectives on this. Like from like from more of a creative standpoint, like what is what do you think like this NFT bubble kind of signifies? Uh, that's a, a really good question. I honestly like you know I have many feels about it. Um, simultaneously, I, I have a lot of friends, and you know I, I've also tried to mint some of my photography into NFTs, um, and it is connecting uh, creators directly into distribution and capital raise, right? There's no intermediary. Um, one of the most powerful traits of an NFT to a creator is the fact that all royalties, and you get to set that percentage of sales, flow back to that creator. So if you create something amazing uh, and it continues to sell ad, infinite, ad infinitum, um, you know, like that comes back to you. That's huge. Uh, therefore, you make something amazing once yeah. and it can really, you can reap the value forever. Um, so that's really, really cool. Now on the flip side, NFTs have also really rewarded people with stronger communities where maybe the content um, wasn't important. It was about the community that was there um, and just sort of reinforced itself. Uh, right. So we've seen that evolution. And I think, you know, it's yep. bigger than that. Even we've now seen uh, like redeemable NFTs that are basically the same as a con concert ticket, except um, it's not quite as finite, right? You don't spend it and forget it. Like maybe it retains, it could open up token, uh, gated content. It could do all sorts of cool things. Maybe it gets you into the next conference and, you know, you get a, a gamified, um, element there. So I think a lot of people look at NFTs now as art and maybe they're like, well, it's digital art and you can copy it and we get a little bit confused, but obviously the functionality to create in a, a sticky community. Um, I think that's really well proven at this point in time, the ability to open up gamified um, sort of mechanics uh, to allow people to also redeem it for something else of value. Um, we've seen really cool communities grow out of this, right? And then those royalties flow back to their treasury and they end up launching a brand new product with the money that yep. they've made from like the secondaries. So it's hugely expansive. I think one funny thing about both DeFi and NFTs um, is that they've been around since 2017 when we first got into this, right? They were just young and early and, you know, everyone yeah. in crypto has had a, a PO app, a proof of, um, what is it? Active, uh, participation. Um, and basically they've been in all these conferences and I may have gotten the name wrong. I apologize. Uh, but it's, you know, it's an NFT. It shows that you've shown up. So we've known about these. It's just that now yep. we're getting to a mature phase where they're becoming their own ecosystem. So Inside, you know, the bull and yeah. bear cycles that we've seen, the summer and winters, I mean, Brian, we've seen like a lot of breaks with DeFi performing differently, you know, going up when the macro sphere was going down and NFTs kind of seem like they're even more in their own world with their own markets. They are. That I mean, that is that is true. I mean, it's kind of uh, the way the current trend, you know, as we stand today here, February 2022, NFTs are still the trending topic. And I think like you made a really interesting point about uh, people criticizing NFTs uh, in the way that, you know, you can kind of like right click and save some of these photos and things like that. And I wanted to, that made me think of like NFTs combined with the other buzzword that we've been hearing all the time. And that buzzword is metaverse, right? So um, once we see NFTs combined with metaverse, where you have a digitally native environment, you can't, you can no longer right click save as, you know, you, your NFTs are digital certificates that cannot be replicated. The authenticity of an NFT cannot be replicated in a metaverse, right? Like in a full digital native environment, now digitally native things such as NFTs hold a ton of value. And as we move into a culture and a generation that has a heavy, um, heavy influence or a heavy involvement in things like metaverse and virtual gaming, VR, AR, then you start getting into some really crazy shit on like the value of NFTs, the importance of NFTs, the provenance that NFTs provide you, the even the interoperability or cross functionality of NFTs is going to be really, really wild to think about, right? I don't even know what it's going to be because it hasn't been done yet. And uh, I'm very excited to see what's going to happen. Um, you know, I think that this is going to be uh, 
this new, I don't know, what's after Gen Z? Gen I don't actually know. What's the next <laughs> generation after Gen Z? You're getting young. Yeah. Whatever that whatever that generation is, yeah. They're gonna live in a world where NFTs are like already in existence <laughs> from and like they've just known them, right? And like that kind of mindset, who knows what kind of like potential is gonna come out of people from that generation. So yeah. um it's a pretty crazy space. We're still super early. Yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, look, like, um, you know, you mentioned the metaverse and and we're obviously focused a lot on all of these things in our product offerings at Republic. Um, we have Republic Realm, who just rebranded every realm, doing active, um, you know, 3D modeling development, creating spaces for people to hang out, working with brands to bring them in there. Uh, Facebook or Meta just announced that they spent $10 billion on Facebook Reality Labs. So on the hardware side, you're seeing tremendous amounts of capital coming in. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically, we're seeing the internet break free of the box, right? Um, and any way that we can interact with it, that we can view it, that we can smell it, that we can feel it, all of these things are really coming, I think, into the forefront in this, these, I don't know, five years, but let's say a decade if we want to give it a really long bit of breathing room. Uh, crypto side, moving extremely quickly. Uh, I would say every day we, we sort of like upgrade. Alpha drop. Uh, every episode, we would like to dedicate at least alpha drop. a little bit of time to some of the, you know, cutting edge alpha that we see. Alpha being, you know, useful knowledge to maybe research on your own for your own investment purposes. None of this is investment advice, but we are going to shine a light on some of the interesting things we're seeing. Um, so, you know, we just actually, uh, or our partner company, Re Republic Capital, uh, participated in this really large round for Polygon, which used to be known as Matic. Um, they raised about $450 million, Sequoia as a lead. Um, that's a tremendous amount of capital. And, uh, you know, I think the alpha drop in and of itself is that if you're getting that much money, what are you going to do with it? And maybe why should you pay attention to this ecosystem? So that being said, Brian, would you just give us a short little intro to what is Polygon, also known as Matic? It's a rebrand. Um, and let's just, let's just kick it off there. Yeah, totally. So Polygon, uh, was formerly known as Matic back in the day, and they rebranded in the past year or so to Polygon. Their token is still called Matic. So you'll probably see both of those terms, um, when you read the news. Um, and the biggest thing to take away with Polygon is that it's what's called a layer two scaling solution on Ethereum. So what does that mean? Right? So we use the word L1, you see L2, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin and Cosmos are considered layer one protocols. They're kind of like the base layer on which things are built. However, as you can probably tell and see if you track Ethereum, there's a ton of it's traffic expensive. on Ethereum. Like there's so many more transactions happening on Ethereum than it can, it can handle, which is why gas fees are high, which is why settlement times take a little bit longer. So people are like, yo, what if we like built a highway on top of Ethereum's you know, surface level streets. And then we just had more transactions happening on top of it. But the main idea or the solution of these transactions get relayed back down to the Ethereum main chain, right? So that's the core idea or the core principle of a layer two scaling solution. And Polygon is one of those. There are a few out there, uh, but today we're talking about Polygon. And essentially Polygon, you can like, basically interact with OpenSea or any of the DeFi applications that we talked about, and they actually are integrated with Polygon. And all you do is switch your MetaMask to point to the Polygon network instead of Ethereum network. And you can start doing everything that you were doing before, except that now it's a little bit cheaper, a little bit faster. And the transactions that you perform uh, eventually do get uh, broadcasted to the Ethereum layer one main chain to be truly settled. It's just that you as a user get a faster and cheaper user experience. So that's kind of like my TLDR on how to think of Polygon and layer two. And, you know, like Graham mentioned, $450 million just got put into this project. Uh, and what's the takeaway here? Like do some math and think about like, okay, where is the value really going to, right? I just told you that Polygon settles on Ethereum. So where do you think all the $450 million is going to be, you know, built on where, what kind of, uh, applications is it going to, what chain is benefiting the most, you know, just kind of do your own, uh, research 
and think about, uh, so Polygon has their own token as well. Very much encourage you to read into the Matic token and uh, how layer twos interact with layer ones. Yeah, and and you know there there's this idea called these the uh, blockchain trilemma, right? The scalability um, that you have to make some concession between security, speed, um, gas price. Ethereum security is top uh, top of mind all the time. Um, so it has sacrificed a lot of its transaction speed. Uh, for really aggressive security. It's never going to give that up. That's why what makes it amazing. So therefore, these other people are saying, hey, we don't need to be super secure for like a very quick transaction, right? Let's let people transact on this cheaper chain with a lower security threshold. And then when we get enough transactions, we can anchor into Ethereum and say, hey, we have this state of transactions. They've all been approved. Let's make them forever on this super secure chain by putting a, uh, a, a little hash into a block on Ethereum. So you're going to see this. There's a variety of other scaling mechanisms. Uh, Matic is, or Polygon is specifically an L2, meaning that it's meant to work on top of Ethereum. There's also other L1s that work with Ethereum. So there's a variety of different approaches. Um, but you know, that being said, I think what Brian covered is really the crux of it. And when you see this kind of capital deployment into an ecosystem, you know, a lot of interesting stuff is going to be built there. That, you know, is something to, to look into. A lot of capital going that way. And um, that's our alpha drop for this week. We will continue to look for very interesting research opportunities on what's happening in the market today uh, that you can or cannot act upon depending on how you feel. Um, so thanks, Brian. I think that really concludes everything that we have to say right now. Uh, and we will be back with more content and we will continue to dive deeper into more specific topics and hopefully give you both entertainment and knowledge in one easy to swallow pill. Thank you, Graham. Thanks for hosting this. And, uh, you know, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, we love just kind of like feeding off of the energy of what people want to hear. You know, that's how we got started. You know, we, we did our presentations to the Republic team and we really just wanted to answer questions for the team. You know, we, have been in the space for so long. We wanted to share our knowledge and we wanted to further our goal of democratizing access to crypto, but you got to also democratize access to knowledge, right? I know Graham is really huge on that. And, you know, we, that's really the whole point of this thing. So please uh, feel free to send us comments. Feel free to let us know what you want to hear about and we'd be happy to talk about it. Absolutely. You are our community and let us grow together.